The science of archaeology can tell us a lot of things about an ancient artifact, or even a whole ancient city. It might be able to tell us the age of what we're looking at, how it was built, and what it was used for. It can't always tell us all those things, though. Sometimes even the best archaeologists are left just as confused by the things they discover as we are. We love it when that happens, because it means we can make a great mystery-filled video like this one. In 2006, scientific researcher Tim Bartholomus was on an expedition in Alaska when he came across something that stopped him in his tracks. There, scattered all over the Root Glacier, were hundreds of balls of moss. The moss looked like it had fallen out of the sky. It wasn't attached to the ice underneath it, and there were no obvious explanations for its presence. Over the next few years, Tim and his colleagues studied the moss and found that not only does the moss hang around for years, but it also periodically moves around the ice in a fashion that appears to be deliberate and coordinated. When the moss moves, it does so at the same speed and in the same direction as the moss balls around it. That'd be easy to explain if the balls were rolling downhill, but that isn't the case. They can move in any direction, and that includes uphill. The pattern of movement isn't consistent with the direction of the wind, so that potential explanation has to be ruled out too. The truth is that 14 years after starting his study, Tim still doesn't know how the balls move around or where they came from. They're a complete enigma. In early 2020, Storm Ciara blasted its way through Scotland, leaving wreckage in its wake. Wreckage wasn't all it left, though. It also left a bizarre-looking skeleton on a Scottish beach, prompting the local press to speculate about whether the remains of the legendary Loch Ness Monster had finally been discovered. Numerous theories have been put forward about the identity of the creature, which was washed up on an Aberdeen beach. Some have suggested that it might belong to a whale or an orca, whereas others insist that it's a giant species of dolphin. The skeletal remains appear to include horns attached to the skull, which could identify it as a thresher shark. Professor David Lisseau, who works at Aberdeen University, is more of the opinion that the bones come from a whale, but says that he'd need to have the opportunity to inspect the skeleton in person before he could reach any conclusions. Sadly, he hasn't had that opportunity yet, so the creature remains unidentified. We're pretty sure it isn't the Loch Ness Monster, though. All the same. The history of human settlement in the British Isles goes back thousands of years, and the country is full of incredible ancient artifacts and structures. The Folkton drums have to be considered as being among the most mysterious of those artifacts. They were discovered at the site of a Barrow burial in East Yorkshire by archaeologists and vicar William Greenwell in 1899. He estimated them to be around 2,600 years old, a figure that's been confirmed by more recent studies. The name he chose for them is very misleading, though. They might look like drums, but you wouldn't get much sound out of trying to play them. They're made of chalk. Each of the so-called drums is covered in geometric patterns and symbols. Although some of the carvings might be intended as representations of human faces, nothing like them has been found elsewhere in Britain. The fact that they were found in a grave of a child might be significant in terms of their intended meaning, but we have no way of understanding that significance. They could be humble children's toys, or they might even have a complex spiritual meaning that we can't even guess at. Many years ago, the area of Telangana in India was the center of the Kakatiya dynasty. It was in this place that they built the Warangal Fort and Temple, an elaborate and ornate construction dedicated to the great god Shiva. It's thought that these structures have stood in situ since at least the 12th century, but they might be even earlier. What we can say for sure is that they were built to last. Warangal has been attacked many times by invading armies over the passing of the centuries, but the incredible fortifications have withstood every assault. When you look at the massive granite blocks that make up the buildings, that's not surprising. 
How did people living 800 years ago fit them together so perfectly that no mortar is required to hold them together? We have no idea. We also have no idea why the pillars around Warangal's gates are covered by carvings of birds, mythical creatures, and lotus symbols, but none of the religious iconography that was typical of the era. Every stone is cleanly cut and polished almost to a shine using techniques that we don't understand. Did our ancient ancestors have access to advanced technology, or have we forgotten a few things that we used to know about building? While we're talking about mysterious things carved from stone, let's go to Arsi in Ethiopia for a closer look at the Tia stone pillars, also known as the Tia stele. There are 46 of these stones in total, all of which are elaborately decorated and in various states of standing up or beginning to fall down. Carved stone monuments aren't unusual in Ethiopia, but the Tia stele aren't considered within the design of anything found elsewhere in the country. Frustratingly, all attempts to date the stones have failed. They're thought to be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 years old, but that's as close as archaeologists can get to a reliable date. Every single one of the Tia stones features an image of swords, human figures, and geometric shapes. It's possible that they're grave markers because of the presence of a series of tombs close to the site. But that's little more than a best guess. 30 years ago, the area was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but that doesn't mean that UNESCO or anybody else understands what type of heritage they're preserving. As you'll know if you're a student of history, ancient Egyptians were extremely advanced for their time in many different ways, with their knowledge of astronomy being especially impressive. By observing and charting the movement of the stars, the Egyptians had a reliable way of mapping the progression of time, a job made easier by inventions like the Merkit. The deceptively simple-looking devices are elaborately decorated wooden or bone bars connected to weighted plumb lines. Along the bar are 24 markings, 12 for the 12 daylight hours, an hour for sunrise, an hour for sunset, then 10 further markings that were aligned to track stars during the nighttime. This was a far more accurate way of measuring time than a sundial because sundials became useless the moment the sun goes down. Theoretically, it would also be possible to use a merquette to determine the angle of a building, so devices like these might have been used to assist in the construction of temples, a process for which alignment to the stars is known to have been important to the ancient Egyptians. The oldest known surviving market was made about 2,600 years ago and is on display in the Science Museum of London, England, although it's likely that markets were in use long before then. The Guyaju Caves can be found on the slopes of China's Tianghung Mountain in the Yanging district of the country. They were noticed by archaeologists for the first time in 1984. That's pretty much the limit of what anybody knows about them. Beyond that, everything is speculation. The complex system of caves, which has been carved directly into the face of the rock, features over 350 individual chambers split between 117 distinct caves. Although an approximate age of 1,000 years has been speculated on, there's no archaeological evidence or artifact at the site that can be dated. Unusual for China, there's also no record of their creation or even their existence in any ancient texts. The question of who made the caves and when remains unresolved. Some Chinese scholars insist that the caves were homes belonging to the Komo Shi culture during the 9th century, but others insist that this is actually an ancient granary belonging to the people of the Tang Dynasty 300 years earlier. Another suggestion is that it's a Han Dynasty garrison for soldiers which would make the Guyaju Caves 2,200 years old. We'll probably never know which of these theories, if any of them, is correct. The Vikings invaded the British Isles over a thousand years ago and stayed there for a while, so Viking discoveries in England and Scotland are common. Through those discoveries, archaeologists can work out how the Vikings lived and even get a few ideas about where they'd been before they came to Britain. 
A hoard discovered in Scotland in 2014 has been partially helpful in that regard, although it's thrown up as many questions as it has answers. The hoard contains gold, silver, jewelry, crystals, drinking vessels, and even a few soft textiles, all of which have been dated to the 10th century. What's puzzling archaeologists is that many of the items, especially the jewelry, comes from parts of the world where Viking activity isn't thought to have been significant. There are items from Byzantium and Rome, for example, as well as Ireland and Anglo-Saxon Southern England. That begs the question of whether they stole these items or whether they traded for them instead. Taken all together, the hoard would seem to confirm that the travels of the Vikings went much further than history books currently tell us they did. Horbazin, in the Tuva region of Russia, is one of the greatest archaeological mysteries in this entire enormous country. Its name translates from the Tuvanian language as clay house, which tells us what it's made of, but not what it was built for. This strange site, positioned on an island in the middle of Terracol Lake, is a relic of the Uyghur culture and was most likely built during the 8th century. When it was first discovered by archaeologists, it was initially thought to be the ruins of an ancient fortress. But subsequent studies have revealed that the layout of the buildings and the rooms they contained is more consistent with the design of an ancient Chinese royal palace. Mysteriously, there's no evidence of human activity in or around the site other than the existence of the buildings themselves. That raises the possibility that it was never used for its intended purpose and may not ever have been finished at all. That might suggest that it was built somewhere around 777 as a temple to followers of the Manichaeism religion. Tengri Bogu Khan, a devotee of that faith, was the ruler of this area in that year, but was violently overthrown in an uprising led by opponents of the religion two years later. With Khan gone and the religion outlawed, any temple dedicated to it would have been deemed a surplus to requirements. You might think that warriors of the Bronze Age wore armor made out of bronze. After all, it was called the Bronze Age for a reason. That doesn't appear to have been the case in Siberia, though. There, in the Siberian city of Omsk in 2014, archaeologists reported the discovery of a suit of armor made entirely out of bone. The bones used in the armor came from a variety of animals, including horses, elk, and deer. The circumstances surrounding the discovery of the armor are mysterious. The 4,000-year-old artifact was buried, but it wasn't in a grave, and there was no sign at the site of the warrior whom it was presumably designed to protect. It also wouldn't have made sense to bury armor like this in any event. It would have offered excellent protection against arrowheads and knives, and as such, it would gladly have been inherited by one warrior in the event of the death of another. It's possible that the burial was meant as a tribute of some kind, but if that's the case, it's strange to find it on its own without any other personal items surrounding it. By the 8th century, there were many different tried and tested ways to build a temple. So it's baffling that anyone would have gone to the trouble of carving one directly out of one huge, singular chunk of rock, as was the case with Vituvan Coil in India. This grand temple looks suspiciously unfinished around its lower levels, which strongly suggests that the people who carved it started at the top and then worked their way down. The top levels are almost unbelievably intricate for this era, decorated with inscriptions on the walls and more than 100 religious sculptures inside its various rooms. Some ancient Indian texts say that multiple rock-hewn Panya dynasty temples existed in the area, but if that's true, then this is the only one that survived the passing of the last 1,200 years. There might be a grisly secret behind the reason why this temple is unfinished. The name Vitruvan Coil translates as the Temple of the Slayer, perhaps confirming the local legend that a father and son competed to see who could build a rock-hewn temple the fastest. When it became obvious that the son would win, the father murdered him to prevent him from completing the task. Many ancient Viking maps make reference to a place called Vinland, which is understood to be the furthest flung from their Norse homeland of all the Viking settlements. It's possible, but not proven, that Vinland was actually the place we now know as Leons Meadows in Newfoundland, Canada. 
This indisputably Viking settlement was built in the early 11th century, making a mockery of the idea that Christopher Columbus was the first European traveler to visit the Americas. The site isn't necessarily full of things to look at, consisting of little more than a few sod-covered wooden buildings, but that doesn't make it any less historically significant. Archaeological evidence collected from the site suggests that the few Vikings who settled here stayed here for roughly 15 years before departing, possibly as a result of a clash between themselves and the pre beothuk natives who are known to have lived in the area. Given that this place is such a long way from Scandinavia, it's difficult to believe that the Vikings arrived here deliberately as they ought not to have known that the North American continent existed. Perhaps they just got very lost at sea. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.